Signore e signori, buonasera. Welcome to Tutti a Casa, brought to you by Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimo at New York University. Uh, it's a great joy and pleasure for me to introduce you do, today to two dear friends and colleagues, one for a long time, one more recent, but both very, very dear to me and two people that I respect enormously. And uh, we have the fortune of having my colleague in the Department of Italian Studies at NYU, Rebecca, Fal Rebecca Falkov, who is a professor of Italian Studies and whose specialty includes contemporary Italian literature, psychoanalysis, gender and sexuality, uh, critical theory, uh, waste studies, literary translation. Rebecca has a new book that just came out. Uh, the title is Possessed, a Cultural History of Hoarding. It was published with Cornell University Press uh, uh, right now. It's about to, to come out. And I invite you to uh, join us in listening to her in a broadcast that she's going to have at the NYU Center for the Humanities on May 5th. As soon as we receive more precise information and the Zoom links, we are going to advertise them in our uh, social uh, pages. So stay tuned for the presentation of uh, Rebecca's own book on the cultural history of hoarding. And uh, the guest of Rebecca for this evening broadcast of Tutti a Casa is Enrico Cesaretti. As we normally do uh, in these cases, I'm gonna leave the honor to present and introduce Enrico Cesaretti to Rebecca, but I couldn't resist being here and saying something because Enrico was my first colleague when I first landed at the University of Virginia many years ago. We will not say how many. Uh, he was there. We started our American adventure together. Uh, he became a very serious scholar and a great professor, as you will see and you will hear from the conversation that he uh, had, uh, that he's going to have with Rebecca. And they say I, I went sort of on an erratic path. Uh, doing other things, but I'm delighted that uh, Rebecca and Enrico is going, are going to present this conversation that actually celebrates the publication of Enrico's newest book, and you will hear from uh, Rebecca's presentation and from their conversation. It couldn't be more timely. It couldn't be more urgent in terms of the topics he addresses. And for all of us who study literature and that very often ask ourselves, why are we doing this for? What is the reason we engage in this kind of literary studies for? Think that the, um, Enrico's book has some very interesting, and again, very timely answers to this question that give meaning to the study of literature, not as a simple intellectual exercise in erudition, but something that can change our way of looking at the world. And that's the reason why I'm delighted to have them both uh, Rebecca Falkov and Enrico Cesaretti here to talk about Enrico's new book. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefano. And buonasera a tutti. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, to host today's episode of Tutti a Casa, um, a dialogue with Enrico Cesaretti, an associate professor of Italian studies at the University of Virginia where he is also the convener of the Environmental Humanities Group. I know that he's a delight to speak with since we met on a plane from New York to Baton Rouge, uh, where the American Association of Italian Studies Conference was held in 2016. He's been a powerful voice in eco-criticism in Italy um, for, for years, um, and it's a, it's a growing field thanks to his work and that of Stacey Alaimo, um, Damiano Benvenu, Serenella Iovino, Elena Pass, Nicolo Scafai, and Monica Seeger, and many others. Um, and uh, Professor Cesaretti is the author of four books, Castelli di Carta, Retorica della Dimora tra Scapigliatura e Surrealismo, which was published in 2001 by Longo Editore, Fictions of Appetite, Elementary Discourses in Italian Modernist Literature, published in the Italian Modernity series with Peter Lang, and Italy and the Environmental Humanities, Landscapes, Natures, Ecologies, which he co-edited with Serenella Uvino and Elena Past, and which was published by the University of Virginia Press in 2018. Today, we'll be discussing his latest book, Elemental Narratives, Reading Environmental Entanglement in Modern Italy, which was published with Penn State University Press in 2020. It's really um, a pleasure to welcome you, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk about this book, which 
um, is really a, a breathtaking and important um, work of eco-criticism and um, brings a lot of canonical and lesser known texts into the conversation about the environmental entanglements in Italy. Enrico, could you tell us a little bit about how you came to this topic and, and why you decided to write this book? Yes, thank you. First of all, thank you to you, Rebecca, for inviting me and for, uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity and the whole staff at the Casa Italiana and, and Stefano, who's been a friend for so long. Um, so yes, I, uh, the story of this book comes uh, from my interest that has never been fading into environmental issues. I was, uh, I was uh, a biology major in, my, in Italy before uh, switching to, to, um, to literary studies. And so this combination of science and, uh, and literature was always something that I, I cared about. But uh, uh, I also, uh, has, have, as, you, as you just mentioned, I was working on Italian futurism and, uh, and modernism. And so that this is a moment that I explored in my previous book, Fiction of Appetite, and what I studied about food. But of course, uh, I was studying about, I was talking and discussing food from a very literary perspective. I was kind of uh, uh, not realizing at the time of the, of the impact of, uh, of agriculture, of the impact on, of uh, um, of food on, 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 on real lives. I was thinking about more in literary terms and theoretical terms, looking for the symbolic value of food in different kinds of literary texts. But then uh, uh, towards the end of the book, uh, as I was, uh, I, I started thinking about, uh, and, and also we've been reading more about the, the actual impact and, and the actual uh, material aspect of, of, of food. And, and then of course, at the same time, I encountered the, the, the scholarly work of, um, of, the, of, of, of people and, and colleagues who were very much, much more advanced than I was in this, in this field, uh, who were exploring the, the ecological impact of food and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and working in this, in, in this field that was a kind of, uh, at the time, uh, barely uh, surfacing in Italian studies in environmental humanities, and so that's basically where uh, where the book um, uh, originated first. Uh, to be to be more specific, um, I was thinking uh, uh, I might want one of one kind of turning point in in my in my way of thinking was a, was a sh was an article that I that I worked on. In, in which I, I addressed matter in futurism and and uh, try to um, to think in, in this in this uh, I, I think of this uh, of this subject um, in relation to the new materialist uh, theories that were um, that were uh, becoming more and more uh, widespread in, in in academia. And, and so that was kind of a, the first time that I that I started thinking about uh, uh, about uh, addressing a matter coming out from the notorious interest that futurists had in this uh, issue in, in matters and in mixing the the organic with the inorganic and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, so this was let's say a more literary uh, reason because I was studying futurism. On the other hand, I, uh, I, as I wrote some other in some other place, I also encountered a more materially. Uh, I, I had a friend who who moved to the uh, coastal town of Rosignano Marittimo in Tuscany, where um, while while I was starting thinking about this book, uh, where there is a, a beautiful place. It's a it's a very typical Mediterranean. Town on, on the on the coast of Tuscany, and Tuscany, of course, is associated with this uh, wonderful Edenic place. Uh, but in this town specifically, it's a it's a factory town. There is this uh, industry. It's called Solve. It's the Rosignano Solve uh, soda baking soda plant, and and that and that is basically uh, has been sitting there for more than a hundred years, and has uh, been dumping chemicals in the in the sea. And they have they have these famous Carib Caribbean-like beaches there, these famous white beaches of Vada, 
which people go and uh, uh, to have to suntan and, and swim into, but as a matter of fact, are, are, are chemical beaches. And so there is a real more, more, a more a very uh, dangerous and, and, uh, and uh, material way of looking at, at, uh, at, at, at the substances that are coming out of this industry. So the combination of those two things, one working on matter on futurism and the other one actually seeing the effects of matter in, a, in, the, real, in the real world um, contributed to shaping this book. Interesting. Um, and I just want to point out to our listeners today that you have a beautiful blog post on the American Society of Literature, or I can never forget, but uh, on the ASLE website. ASLE, um, yes. About, about uh, Rosignol Silva, so, no, about. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's really, it's really powerful and exquisite. And um, so uh, we can put the link up um, with this. But right. I also wanted to talk about, um, I mean, you, you just explained how to some extent you came to this through the literary text that you know well, including um, Futurism, uh, Palacetsky, um, and I, I was really struck reading the way you talk about Marinetti in the first chapter of your book um, and how um, I don't think you're reading against the grain necessarily. I don't think that's that's your project at all to be reading against the grain. But I think I was really um, moved by your attentiveness to sort of. Um, excuse me. By your attentiveness to the way that um, Marinetti is an is an odd choice um, given futurist determined sort of um, stance of of manipulating, exploiting, extracting matter that seems you know it seems very compatible with the kind of um, modern ethos that would result in ecological catastrophe. And I think that your reading of Marinetti um, is is such a powerful example of the way that you let in the ambiguities of the text um, and don't um, don't sort of relent on the the reading part um, of your title, Elemental Narratives, Reading um, Environmental Entanglements in Modern Italy. And that, that this is very much about a praxis and about a way of understanding text that kind of um, ethically uh, reorients us not only as readers but as kind of denizens of the Anthropocene. Um, I thought it. I thought it was really um, exquisite the way that you you deal with Marinetti in that first chapter. And thank you so much. Yeah. And I think it's. Uh, um, I, I think this is a monumental book. And not only do you sort of put. Into, I mean, you've you've been working in in eco criticism and um, the and the environmental humanities for a long time, and and you've become really one of the prominent voices in the field in Italian studies. And um, one of the things that this book really does is it charts the the theoretical necessity of um, a new way of thinking about reading and about understanding, um, under, uh, uh, reading not just the literary text, but the world as text. Um, so I, I guess I was wondering if you could, you could speak a little bit about what it means to read eco-critically. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, first of all, thank you. You're a very generous reader. And I, I, I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm usually very honest and, um, yes, I, I've been studying and I've been learning a lot, uh, about this, uh, this field in the past few years. Uh, but it's something is, is for me, it's been honest. It's been like a career change in a way, you know, because you, you discover a new, a new direction, a new field. And, uh, of course I have, I have many people to thank for, for this and they are listed in the, in the, in the, uh, acknowledgement page of my book. And, uh, and, and without them, uh, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be having, I, my book wouldn't exist really, but, and that's also, uh, many of the things that I gave for granted somehow. And I, um, I discuss in my book are also 
uh, I also uh, they also deriving from from the work of other scholars from the idea that uh, we need to look at the word uh, as uh, at the material word as a text and not just uh, at literary text and looking at the at the signs that these words is communicating to us is certainly not out of my uh, out of my own uh, 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 invention is something that has been uh, uh, fundamental to the to eco so especially to this field of material eco criticism which as many of you many of our listeners already know has been uh, il illustrated by the work of uh, Serenella Jovino and Serpil Opperman in their in their groundbreaking book uh, they, in which they they build up on the on the new uh, materialist turn in the humanities and they show how this new materialist turn can be applied to uh, both um, uh, enhancing our reading of literature and at the same time how it, this in turn this reading our literature can enhance and 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 and, and contribute to uh potentially uh modify our our attitudes and our, our, our positions towards the real world so um so that that's something that um that uh, that uh, of course uh, has been explored by 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 this uh, by these scholars, but the idea is basically the fundamental idea. And again, I'm, I find myself probably quoting again that their work is that uh, uh, with our life, our life basically uh, uh, is is um, the the world in we live in and and we in which we breathe is the same world in which we. Um, we produce literature, so there is a natural connection between the two. And there's, we have the, the long tradition of thought that has been kind of keeping this word separate, thinking that one is culture and one is nature, while at the same, if you think in these different ways, I kind of, I kind of, for me, it's kind of very natural to think in these terms. Uh, and there's no other way. <laughs> there must be the way. You know, it's, it's, this, it all obvious, it's kind of obvious that the way in, the way in which you live uh, produces certain certain results if you write a book or or if you your create on your creativity there is some kind of relation the place you live affects the way you think or the way you behave uh, so that that kind of connection between the uh, the material world the real world and and the and the creative side the imaginative side are 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 crucial to um to this discipline, to this um, uh, position, let's say, and and so the effort uh, uh, and the and the struggle is is to learn how to um, to read both both one through the other, uh, through to 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 manage to um, to have one enhance the other uh, with the, with the common goal of hopefully making us um, realize something we. We we didn't we hadn't realized before, and um, it it seems like uh, I mean what what you just said about the necessity of sort of understanding um, the materiality of the world and the world in which we dwell and the specificity of of um, the places we inhabit um, with elemental you know this idea of both elemental narratives and entanglements. Um, but your project is certainly not to disentangle um, into the elements, but to what is the relationship between um, the, the complexity of an entanglement and the distilled form of an element? Um, well, yeah, that's uh, with with the entanglement. I meant that we are we are part as as again I'm quoting Stacey Alimo, one expression that she said we are the stuff of the world so we are not separate from the elements that surround us and you can to make a simple example you know uh, as as I try, uh, try to make in the book you know every and, and the, the body thinking about the body the, the human body and we know that there are uh, chemicals that are crossing uh, they're entering our body every day and so the singularity or the or if you wish what you mentioned i forgot the, the exact term the purity of the element um it might be very well the element is pure but 
or or or, or a virus thinking in terms of what's happening today mm-hmm. but but we are entangled with that there is no way of uh, of separating ourselves with with what's surrounding us um so that that um that idea that we we uh, again uh again simplifying the the issue here we 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 tend to we have been traditionally thinking about the human as a kind of enclosed uh space separate from uh from the rest of the world so or above the world in a hierarchical way you know so the idea instead of thinking in kind of a more horizontal fashion in which we see ourselves as the same exact part sharing and in relationship with everything else that that is surrounding us elements and and and, and animals and and all, all the rest of life of the biotic uh, life in, in and non biotic also as i you know elements themselves um in order to um if we if we have and if we have that kind of position maybe uh we would be uh behaving in a slightly different way towards towards this world the exterior um, world I don't know yeah. if I answer. Okay. Yeah, that is, that, thank you. Um, what is this, can, I, was, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, some of the, well, for example, Pierandello's um, stories about sulfur um, and yeah. the way that you read those draws out, I mean, Pierandello is obviously a canonical Italian author. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, he's, um, this is, this is literature, but there hasn't been a lot of attention paid to the extent to which his literary project is rooted in, um, you know, not, not, uh, labor in an abstract form, but something that is very much a part of, of the environment in which he finds himself. And could you talk a little bit about, um, those sulfur stories and how you read them? Sure, sure. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, um, Pirandello, yeah, is a fabulous, uh, fabulous author. I, I just thought this morning uh, in my class uh, a couple of these short stories, one of which is Mal di Luna, Male di Luna. And, and we watched the episode of the Taviani brothers. And uh, and we, we I, I pointed out to, to my students the, the way in which um, there is this scene in which the woman Sidora keeps cleaning the the uh, the tiles in which uh, in the in the small uh, roba that she has in the countryside to keep the dirt out of it, and that that to me, uh, having been exposed probably too much to this kind of <laughs> theories, I mean, again, we are talking about nature and culture. No, we are talking about her attempt to keep at, at bay something that that um uh, that she doesn't want to or, or she wants she thinks that she can keep at bay without being affected but then of course we know that her her husband is is crazy is is an animal and so that kind of a attempt to keep things separate is not possible we, we are we are we are making a mess you know things are coming together but sorry i'm realizing i'm talking about la, 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 i'm talking about different sources so, so yes uh, talk about to go back to to sulfur and Pirandello, uh, yes, of course, Pirandello's also had had a had a sulfur mine. His family, first of all, in in the in the Sicilian uh, countryside, so he was well aware of uh, not only of the of the efforts and the um, and the and the and the difficulties and the conditions of the workers uh, because because he was uh, on the on the right side on the side of the owners, let's say. Uh, but of course, he also had another kind of sensibility. Can, we can say, in addition to being uh, to being a, a, a mine, a cave owner, uh, uh, and um, and um, and so he describes. There are several short stories. Um, I focus mostly on Il Fumo, the smoke, uh, in which he describes the the the, the not only the the terrible. Uh, the, the the hellish landscape that has that is surrounding this kind of uh, place in in the Sicilian uh, countryside, which is already, as we know, deserted and dry on its own, and and then when you add this kind of 
uh, deep holes in in uh, with, uh, with with for to extract uh, to extract the mineral and and Sicily was one until until um, uh, the United States began to produce more Sicily was one of the centers for sulfur extractions in the world they were sending it all over the place uh, so he um, so he he describes the condition of the workers the landscape so I I I I, I, I it was a very um, a very uh, useful uh, sh narrative to to think about, and, and that's what I do in my in my uh, discussion, to think about uh, the notion of extraction, which is a more more contemporary uh, notion. And and I, in fact, I I remember if I remember correctly, I, I quote uh, an article by Mezzadra and Nilsson that talks about extractive form of capitalism, and and. Um, and so here we see in this short story, which was which was um, written at the beginning of the century, uh, we see this this awareness of Pirand that Pirandello has of the dynamics of of extraction and the way in which describes the the fate of the workers and in the way in which describes the connection, the desperate fate of the workers to the to the fate of the land, which becomes burned and and becomes. Uh, Desolate. So there is this this awareness that what happens to the land is not separate to, from what it happens to to the people who live and 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 need to make a living in this land. So that for me was an exactly another kind of exemplification of this entanglement, another manifestation, if we want. Um, and so yeah, that was a discovery for me too. Uh, but I always had the hunch, a hint, hunch, yes, that Pinandello. Um, Pirandello could be read uh, in this in this way, and again, I uh, have colleagues who had kind of also had shared this position. There is an article about from Luca Somigli that um, that talks about um, uh, one of the novels in which it talks about again nature and the way in which it depicts nature, the filo d'erba, something I forgot exactly what the contest was, but anyway, was inspiration came from from a variety of sources, let's say. So you just mentioned Luca Tomini, and you, you've mentioned a number of other scholars. I said this to you by email, but as I was reading Elemental Narratives, I was so struck by um, what, what a rigorously ethical citation practice you have in Elemental Narratives. And it's not, um, it's not just that you do a, an experience exquisite job of citing um, a lot of sources, but that you map a field um, in a way that that opens it up um, for scholars and that sort of um, draws on, that, that sort of produces and acknowledges. Um, and of course, citation always does this to some extent, but I think it's really remarkable the extent to which you um, chart nascent field of Eco-criticism in Italy and beyond, and I think it's. Um, I mean, I hope that that some of our listeners are um, scholars interested in the topic who who will find this an incredibly valuable resource. Um, it's it's well, really thank you, thank you. As I as I as I said, thank you, thank you, Rebecca. You're you're very generous. Again, somebody somebody who had a different agenda might say, "Oh, what, it, you know, it, quoting somebody else." You know, too many quotes. You just make make you have to hear your voice. Yes, uh, that's that's my that's one other way of looking. I, I heard your voice. I heard your voice in there very clearly and and very, I mean, very um, very clearly, but but still acknowledging how um, you're not a voice alone. You're um, no, I, I think it it's really remarkable. Um, yeah, one 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 thing that I, I or, sorry interrupted you, sir. No, go ahead. No, I said one thing that I learned from from my colleagues is that this field, elemental, uh, you know, environmental humanities, and this is something that I really uh, believe is that is not uh, you cannot do this comp on your own. Like we need to we need to share, and we it's a relational uh, effort and. Um, and I and I I I I learned to think more along those terms. So I I I really enjoy if uh, acknowledging the people who and I don't have any problems uh, hiding the the fact that it's not my uh, 
farina del mio sacco, as you say, is not is not is not my thinking, but it's somebody else. So that's um, something that I don't um, that I, I I like to do, uh, and uh, um, so that and, and the and the idea that um, that again the the commonality of effort, the relationality of, of effort contributes to advancement of knowledge in in general. That's that's a good thing, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and the way, I mean, the way you just explained it, I think kind of underscores this idea that what you're what you're doing is also absolutely in harmony with the project of eco-criticism and with the project that it's not just a, a sort of scholarly practice, it's a theoretical, um, it's an important theoretical contribution. Um, it is absolutely, is that my computer? No, it's computer mine, I'm sorry. Maybe we can cut oh, that. Okay, no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, yeah, no, I, I think it's it sort of, it, um, well, if the idea is to see how, in t how, how um, completely enmeshed we are and to see, right. see the entanglements, then it would, of course, be impossible to be um, a kind of lone genius uh, working in isolation and and yeah. um, that's yeah. that that model of scholarship is itself um kind of discordant with this approach in eco-criticism and i think that's a really powerful um, yeah. revelation yeah yeah and the effort the effort and the challenge is to um is to make everybody think even 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 uh, Academics, you know, academic system, uh, universities, where again, in, uh, the the tendency in many places still to focus on on the insularity of of of, of the disciplines and 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 uh, and the scholarship, rather than encouraging or facilitating the sort of um, of ex of collaboration that uh, that the environmental humanities are. Um, uh, uh, enhancing our, our thinking about, our, our promoting, and and so um, that that is definitely uh, again something that I I like. Uh, I'm learning a lot of other things about sciences that I I liked before, and as you know, it's kind of um, necessary in this time to kind of um, expand the horizon rather than narrow it down. Yeah. Yeah, and on the subject of sciences, that was another thing that really, um, I mean, you're, in your introduction and first chapter, you do, um, it, it's clear that you have a, a rigorous scientific understanding of a lot of the relevant industries and of the industrial history in Italy and are, um, I mean, you've, you've sort of distilled such an a, um, impressive history of uh, the economy and industry into um, in a in a way that is uh, that that kind of lets us see where literature intervenes in important ways and I, and I thought it was really beautiful but um, on the subject of, of the history of industry in Italy I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the petrochemical romance and mm. you know if the discussion of the um, of sulfur in Il Fumo um, is perhaps more harmonious with an eco-critical perspective where we're recognizing the enmeshment of, of um, the environment and human bodies um, or, you know, the extent, or, yeah, we're, we're seeing how intertwined or inextricable they are. Um, but in, the, in, in your second chapter, um, you deal with a lot of, of uh, text from Il Gatto Selvatico yeah. and kind of the what we can learn from um, texts that were commissioned yeah. by uh, looters. By, sorry, uh, well, yeah, I, missed, I missed the last word. By, test the way no, commissioned by, by, by polluters, polluters, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, these were very interesting um, books uh, and, and articles, you know, because um, these these are uh, propaganda, propaganda publication that uh, any the the Italian hydrocarbon 
uh, corporation uh, had over over the years, and, and especially in the '60s and the '50s. So this was one of the one of the most uh, popular. And any uh, used to um, hire writers and, and directors, as as, as 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 you know, uh, there were uh, directors like Yoris Evans and, and many other who were asked to shoot films for any in order to show how um, how important uh, oil was in the new Italian economy, and and um, and 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 also writers. So there are uh, very short, uh, very short um, s- stories in, the, in, in this Gatto Selvatico was a publication that had different different sections, and one of the sections was also a literary section, which on the one hand, of course, shows how. Uh, far sighted Mattei uh, was and and the and the editorial team at any was because they they saw the, the the role of literature they saw the role of storytelling in uh, advancing their corporate uh, interests of course uh, on the other hand of course what they wanted these writers to uh, to write was propaganda was to show that oil was uh, very important. Uh, Material in, for Italian economy, and so they hired people from you know uh, there were a long list of, of writers, uh, some more famous than than not. And I I deal with uh, but the most interesting in this in, in this group were those who had some kind of even though they were uh, somehow uh, uh, pretending to not not pre, I wouldn't say pretending, but the, while they were pro- making propaganda for any, they were also undermining any on the side. So one of these that I that I address was uh, Leonardo Sciascia, for example. Mm-hmm. And he was um, uh, was writing about Gela and what about this plant that Annie was building in, in front of the coast uh, of Gela. And he wrote a short piece for El Gatto Selvatico that then became a documentary. Uh, we, we, he wrote the screenplay, the, the director um, was, uh, now I, my, the name escapes to me, but um, anyways, the director, the, the 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 documentary shows the effects uh, of uh, of um, of the um, of the oil plant that that Annie is building in front of Jela and 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 uh, boasts the 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 good things that this plant can do, but at the same time, uh, as I discuss it, I also uh, point out some. Uh, implicit um, criticism or some implicit uh, comment neg- not not as positive comment about the 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 the, the effects that that this uh, oil plant is doing on the on this location and uh, in the short piece in the Gato Silvatico, these elements are emerging even more clearly uh is is wondering towards the end you know what uh, what um, what is the fate? You know, it leaves the question open. You know? So he's not confident that that bringing progress in this backyard uh, town uh, and and money would actually be the solution for the best for this place. So, but even just that that through these through Il Gatto Selvatico, there's um, there's there's almost a different concept of what it means. Um, of of how one should see, or the, I mean, the 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 larger project, let's say, of Il Gatto Salvatico is kind of um, sharing the fantasy or the idea that becomes kind of common sense that, um, well, not common sense, but um, that you know, driving driving is part of what it means. Driving and seeing the world through a car. Um, I mean, even your your discussion of of what the logo yeah. is intended to convey that that these stories are helping to form very um, underlying ideas about how time is used and um, how one relates to the environment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. You uh, do you talk a little bit about the specificity of material ecocriticism in Italy. Um, what what is so different about 
um, about Italian eco-criticism? What are the particular, um, whether it's the environmental history in Italy or um, the, the literary texts or the approach to, to thinking about literature with an eco-critical perspective? Um, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. I I, I don't want I, my I think what one of the things I I tried to accomplish was to show how actually you know Italy is not that different from many other places. So uh, eco criticism or the thinking or as, as to use this. Uh, expression that is stamped in my mind, keeping one foot in the land and one foot in literature that is, belongs to Cheryl Grotfeld, the, one of the first, uh, um, first scholars who coined the term, came out with the term. Uh, what, one of the objectives I had what to, was to, um, to, to, to think, you know, eco-critical analysis doesn't have borders. You know, thinking about environment, when you think about a toxic cloud, it, it's not that the cloud is limited to, to Italy, but it can go to France, it can go to Europe, it, it moves around, you know? So again, the this, this, this same kind of analysis that I had in mind was to show that talking about Italy, it's the same as talking about the Caribbean or the or the or the or North America, and and it has an equally valid um, uh, scholarly point. And so the the question for me was was also to show that Italian studies, in a way, counts in this field because again, environmentally. Environmentally, environmental humanities are not limited to national borders. And so we can talk about every place. There are many places that are many, many things are recurring, many, many uh, situations and, and, uh, and environmentally um, obnoxious uh, um, behaviors are everywhere. So, so talking about Italy, uh, on the one hand, I, I, again, I use it as, as, a, as a lens, as I say, and I, again, I'm probably quoting somebody else here, to look at the, at the whole world. But of course, being an Italianist and being somebody who knows more about this country than other places and, and trained into literary studies, uh, that's where I focus my attention. And if I had to say one, one of the additional, just I try to add on, on and thinking uh, at, at your question, one of the interesting thing about Italy is that we have this, this powerful uh, this this historical humanistic tradition, and so thinking about the human or thinking about the position of human beings vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, vis-a-vis -vis their non-human world, has probably a particular resonance in Italy, and it can be um, particularly uh, inspiring uh, to think about the heritage. Heritage in inheritance of of humanism and 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 how that is increasingly being questioned is increasingly being reassessed or increasingly being commented upon without rejecting the uh, the, the 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 obvious uh, important uh, heritage that we that we have, but also thinking about um, the ways in which maybe has. Um, has somehow fa failed is a stronger term, but somehow the, the way some some aspect in which it can be re rethought or, or re-envisioned uh, to be to be more. So that those those I, I would say are the some ideas on on this yeah. this issue. Um, no, it's it's really fascinating because I mean, on the on the one hand, one one would almost be tempted to sort of take an eco-critical perspective that, that um, disentangled uh, materials such that instead of Italian narratives, one might look at sort of sites of sulfur extraction. Um, but I think that what you're, you know, what you're doing in this book is, is so deeply embedded within, with, within um, language and industrial history and economic history and that um, that what a lot would also be lost um, if 
the sort of disentangling, if they're, I mean, you're not disentangling, but if one sought to um, do a kind of, uh, a, a sort of story through hyper objects that would take uh, sulfur mines all over the world. I mean, there's there's nothing no. wrong with a project like, but yeah. but language is still essential here and yeah. kind of the the fruit of human, um, I don't want to say genius, the fruit of human labor, yeah. whether whether in its economic and, and um, market forms or in its uh, texts and uh, texts of various forms. I think they're, they're like, you know, I always, every so often I wonder about um, new materialism that, that too strongly brackets um, the necessity of uh, the, the fact that, I mean, new materialism from a humanistic perspective that brackets the human in such a way as to disregard the necessary vehicle that language is providing in literary works. And that is, that is quite human. So, um, I mean, I, I think, I think the key is in the entanglements and that, that an approach and, and what you just said, um, about one foot in literature and one foot in the material environment. Yeah. Or, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I tend to agree and, and I find my, I find it impossible in a way we, um, as I said, I, I, um, I mean, I, I've been, it's hard to, to get rid of the language and the, and the linguistic aspect, but at the same time, we can realize that, um, and there the, are the, the other kind of communication and we don't have to discount those other kind of communications. Uh, so the, the focus can be more on communication uh, or also on communication besides language. Because if we, as again, something again, and then I, I think I extrapolate from, from your comments and we definitely don't want to discount the human, but we don't want to discount the other forms of communication that are happening around us. Because if we do that, we tend to think about the rest of the world as inert, as dead. And so that is kind of the first step to allow us all the behaviors that we've been um, thinking. And if we start, if we think that, okay, a plant can communicate, an animal can communicate, then again, we, um, we might be thinking twice before doing something against those being i i think it comes through really powerfully in this wonderful book um and i'm i'm really happy to have had the chance to work on it and think about it so much um uh could you what if, well first i'd like to hear a little bit more about asbestos um mm, and sure. and how you're dealing with asbestos narratives yeah, yeah. I dedicated a chapter to asbestos. Um, I and again, I try to think of it as this substance as uh, as active as uh, these little fibers in the air. And I read it in the environment. we basically in um, in Casale Monferrato, which is um, already was um, briefly mentioned in um, Jovino's book, uh, 2016. I go a little more. Also in, in depth on the uh, on the literary side, and I I, I address a couple uh, one I think one one uh, uh, book which is um, Alberto Prunetti Amianto Asbestos in Italian, where he talks uh, he talks about the the um, his dad. He talks about uh, a toxic it's a toxic biography, but somehow in which he he, he goes over the story. Of his father, who worked in as a as a pipe fitter in, all over Italy, including Casale Monferrato, and and his job exposed him to to asbestos. So, is uh, what is the field? The field here uh, to define it would be uh, ecology and 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 um, and work. You know, the field of work. Uh, how 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 the, the, these two. These two fields come come together, and I, I read this book as um, 
as a toxic biography. And again, I borrow the, the term from, uh, from Stacey Alimo, who is this um, scholar in, in American, American literature who, uh, who analyzed similar texts in, in, in the States. And I said, well, this is something that is occurring very much in, in, in Italy as well. And, and there is this uh, production of texts uh, around us best so they show the effects of this fiber on the landscape, on, on places, and on human bodies. And um, I show, again, the, the agency of this material to, to affect uh, places and imagination to, to show, to, to, to have an influence on, on, both, on both spheres. Um, and I, I, I end this chapter with, with uh, or talking about Casale Monferrato and, and on a note of hope, as I try to uh, made an effort to, to do on um, every chapter somehow, not to be uh, as pessimistic as I, I am in reality, <laughs> probably try to communicate as a less pessimistic view. But uh, uh, with this, with this uh, uh, re, uh, re-inhabitation, a re- remodeling of the, of the plant where the Eternit plant was in Monferrato. They, they, the, the, the city was able to dismantle and to create a park. And, and so now this area has been sa- 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 saved. And, and there is a art that is art for art is there. There are there are uh, there's land art that is taking place there that is uh, contributing to raise awareness about asbestos pollution all over the world. And there is, I, I talk about an, an initiative, a particular initiative that, that was uh, linked to this place. Um, so yes, uh, and there are many, many other, again, I, I am thinking about um, many other novels and, and, um, and theater piece, theatrical piece, uh, transmedial uh, forms that I, that I mentioned briefly because somebody else has worked on this, um, on this uh, field specifically, in which asbestos returns. And all, all of that is because, of course, it's a kind of reacting, reacting to, um, to, the, to the effects that this uh, substance has, has done, has made on, on, the, on the territory in a, in a devastating way. And we are still paying, they're still paying the price, uh, workers are still dying because it's a very slow and I, like Rob Nixon I talked about slow violence. It's a violence that that surfaces over the years. It's not something that you see immediately, but it's something that emerges over a long period of time. So that's um, yeah, that's something uh, that I I learned. And that that almost requires narrative um intervention because we can't see it we don't know it's yes Yes. um that that somehow the the humanistic production is necessary to understand what's happening yeah yeah absolutely um so what's next Uh, did i did i see something about hazelnuts Oh yeah, yeah. That's what. I, yeah, that's what I've been. I've been. Uh, I've been talking about a little, a little. Yes, yes. Uh, I've been. Um, I've been uh, writing and thinking about hazelnuts, and uh, uh, this is uh, the hopefully, hopefully, the beginning of something new and new project. Uh, is like the. It's like the nocciolo. The in nuce, as it is, the beginning of uh, of a new thing, hopefully. But yeah, I've been uh, my, la- my my latest thing is this um, is this article on on hazelnuts. I I started from Fenoglio and Pavese and notice uh, the references they make to to hazelnuts in their um, in their novels and short stories in the Lange, and then um, as I discussed this. Um, Presence is kind of a kind of a pretext to talk about the agricultural changes that happen in the Lange, how this place has been progressively uniformed and the, they eliminated all the fruit trees and the and the landscape has changed over recent years because of the vineyards that they put. So 
uh, on a way has it has improved. The financial be- well being of the place has improved, but on the other hand, specifically regarding hazelnuts, the the, plant, the, the plants have diminished. The production is is less, and so I link this um, the information that we get from from these two from these authors from these two literary works. To the um, to the policies and the and the uh, and the intention of of Ferrero Corporation, which is the pro- the, the makers of Nutella, uh, they plan to they, who are based in they are based in Alba, which is in Piedmont, where exactly a few miles from where both Fenoglio and, and Pavese were born, and I I discuss their um, their um, Claims of sustainability uh, in terms of uh, of with a look with with the with a look at how they plan to develop hazelnut plantations in other places beyond Piedmont. And so I I start again on in in the text with with Pavese and Fenoglio, and then I get out of the text and I look at the real landscapes of uh, planned. Uh, Hazelnut plantation, specifically in the Altopiano dell'Alfina, which is in between uh, near Lake Bolsena in, in Latium, and where Ferrero is buying land and is planting rows of hazelnuts, which are very uh, fertilizer intensive, and they're basically dispossessing the uh, peasants, the the, the 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 communities of peasants who who were there and. And the, the, the latest film by Alice Rohrwacher, uh, Omelia Contadina, talks about exactly this thing. And I, I found myself, uh, luckily, um, uh, and uh, thinking about these things. And, and I, the, the, when I started writing the article, the, the, her film had not yet uh, been presented in Venice. So it was really uh, comforting and, and a way to, to uh, see that I, I wasn't just. Um, completely making up things in my mind. And what about um, Ecotrauma? The cinema of Ecotrauma, is oh, that yeah. film part of the- Yeah, that, that was, uh, that's another, I am not, I'm not, I am learning about media, Ecomedia, I have my colleague, Elena Past has been teaching me a lot about that. But I, I venture and I try to do, again, uh, experiment with different things. So this was uh, also, Thanks to the invitation of a colleague of mine, uh, I um, I was asked to contribute to to a volume. So I picked out, and I had encountered the work of this documentary filmmaker, a Sardinian filmmaker. Um, uh, his name is Mario Azzeni. If I'm not, I mean, Azzeni is the second name for sure. And he he when I, I encountered while I was writing my book about about um, oil in Sardinia is the same chapter about. Um, about um, in which I discuss any, and he made he made this documentary at the time I was writing my book. I couldn't access it. I didn't have time. But later on, I thought, oh, that would be. It's called Immorti di Alos, the death, the dead of Alos. And he basically, it's a it's a mix of um, of uh, docu fiction, uh, and he, this, he imagines he imagines a community in this village that is being. Uh, Killed by a toxic cloud coming out of a petrochemical petrochemical plant, and in a very poetic way, it's a it's a wonderful um, documentary narrated in Sardinian. And so this is this is a trauma. It's a, the, the book is dedicated to eco trauma, and so this is a, I, I I saw this documentary as embodying or representing very well the um, the trauma that uh, this place. Uh, th- this village, which is a real village, which is called Gairo Vecchio in, in Sardinia, which is a ghost town right now because it's been emptied out. But the creativity and the imagination of the director uh, can merge the, the reality with, the, with fiction. And, and Gairo Vecchio was, was, um, uh, was emptied because of floods. And the floods were due to deforestation. So there is another trauma, a real trauma, that is not oil as the director imagines but it's another trauma that is very much uh, present on the land it's um uh, it's, it's 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 a deforestation that happened when the savoia already uh started started cutting sardinian woods uh and thinking about uh think about it a novel like uh, giuseppe 
Bonaviris, uh, La Foresta di Norbio, uh, that talks about exactly those times. So I try to, to connect again this kind of um, fictional and real events in order to, to discuss this ecological trauma that affects both places and people in Sardinia. It's, this is, it's a fascinating book. It's a beautiful book, a monumental book that, um, that sort of draws from and gives back to the field of the environmental humanities in Italy. Um, and I think what you just said about the, um, the sort of deforestation causing the flooding, that the, um, the entanglements are so manifold um, and so interdisciplinary um, and so uh, long uh, longitudinal that um, it that to tell a story requires some disentangling, um, and yet the story is, is in the entanglements, and mm -hmm. it's a very um, you know I think that that that's the challenge of a scholar working um, in the environmental humanities or, or in material ecocriticism. Um, to understand how to tell a story of everything through an through one, you know, how to tell the story of everything through a, a story that yeah. somehow doesn't oversimplify and also doesn't become so complicated that the story dissipates into the totality of the universe. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to do that when when uh, writing or, you know, in a work of fiction, and perhaps even harder to do it in a work of criticism. Um, and so, Pompey, it was really a pleasure to read. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, yeah, and telling, telling the story is crucial. Storytelling as a, as a, as a gesture of, uh, of sharing and, and, um, and saving also, uh, caring and, and, and saving, hopefully. That's, uh, that's important. And what we are doing here today, I think it's part of this storytelling. No? We, are, we are telling, I, I've been trying to tell a story in a way that is um, uh, approachable and understandable uh, also in, in the book. I, I, I think we oftentimes, especially we in, academic, in literary studies, we tend to, to complicate our lives too much. So I think we, we should think about making, uh, making things more accessible for, for, a wider, for a wider audiences. As, as you are, as, as the example of the, that you are giving us at NYU is, is, is excellent, I think, that we should all follow in this sense. <laughs>